Chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. About that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. When he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church of, under God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him, saying, Rise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith to him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second war, they came to the iron gate that leadeth the city, which opened to them of his own accord. That's where they get those modern doors and those stores, you know. You come up to the thing, and it opens up by its own accord, and says, way back in here, going on time. And they went out, and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety the Lord has sent his angel, and delivered me out of the hand of Herod from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. That is blessing the written and spoken word this morning. And I pray if there's any unsaved person that got in this building this morning, they'll not go unsaved. They came here unconverted, may they be converted when they leave. And may this Easter season not be a time for them just remembering some good things, some spiritual thoughts or holiday season, but a time of encountering and meeting the risen Lord, who is arose from the dead, and we've just sung about, He arose. And we're thankful this morning, for there's hope beyond the grave. And we believe it and know it to be so, because you conquered, we're going to conquer someday. Help us to preach with this assurance in mind, and bring this conviction to the heart of someone here this morning who doesn't believe it. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now this past before us, we have Easter mentioned the only time in the Bible, and the term, of course, is a familiar term. It's a reference to a pagan festival that was carried on in Babylon called, named after the goddess Ishtar, and it happens to occur at the same time of the year the Passover occurs. So for a Jew, this time is the time of unleavened bread. Verse 3. But for the Romans, like uh, Herod, verse 1, it's the time of Easter. When Martin Luther translates the Texas Leceptus, every time he comes the word Passover, he says Erster, that is Easter, because that's the time we connect with it. Uh, Easter in America is a time usually of remembering bunny rabbits and eggs. Or they said in one Sunday school, who was Peter? And some little boy there about six years old said, well, he was a wabbit, wasn't he? <laughs> that's the kind of thing you get into. Well, the Peter in the Bible is not a wabbit. He's an apostle. And he spends Easter in the slammer. He's in jail. He's in jail. Some way to celebrate Easter. <clears throat> you know, this world celebrates Easter because they believe Jesus Christ is dead. They think his teaching's alive. They think his spirit is alive. But they know he's not around to harass them. And if he were around to harass them, they wouldn't care for him. You ever stop thinking about this? They gave him a marble slab to sleep on a rich man's tomb, and when he was alive, they wouldn't give him a pillow to put under his head. Wouldn't you thought they had some kid? If they really cared for him, why not take care of him while he was alive? I mean, the world honors him because they, he's not around to harass him. Why give him a costly tomb to die in and wouldn't even give him a residence to stay in? He said the foxes have holes and the birds there have a nest, but the son of man hath nowhere to lay his head. Take care of him after the dead, huh? If you love them, you take care of them while they're alive. This world didn't have any use for Jesus Christ. It didn't take care of them while he was alive. Now, I learned some things looking at this passage here that are very important. And first of all, I learned this. Verse 1. I learned that we, and I say we, referring to mankind, are trapped by the devil at his will. Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He killed James, the mother of John, with a sword, threw Peter in the slammer. Just did what he wanted to do, because he was king. The devil has his way in our lives normally. And before you were saved, the devil had his way in your life night and day. Amen. The Bible said to her, and he says, oh, "...when meekness instructing those, they may recover themselves from the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will." And if you're an unsaved person in this building this morning, my first Easter news to you is that you are a prisoner of Satan, and it's at his uh, directive, and it is his, it at it, 
It is his whim and his deliberation. You have nothing to do with it. You have no control over it. He's got you. He's got you. I'll be the devil gets man. You find people think they're so good they don't need to be born again, and so good their religion can save them, and so good their sacraments can save them. There are people whom the devil has got a hold of. I believe the devil gets a hold of folks. I have here the words of Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda, the first night of your Adolf Hitler speak. If ever the devil got a hold of a guy, while he was listening to a message, the devil got a hold of Goebbels. Hitler was preaching, and Goebbels said this, and the man up there speaks on, and whatever was budding in me falls into shape, a miracle. Those around me are no longer strangers, they are brothers. No more are he, he's a prophet. Sweat is pouring down his face, a pair of eyes glow in the pale face, his fists are clenched, and like the last judgment, word after word is thundering on. I seem demented, I begin to cheer, no one seems astonished. He in the rostrum glances on me for a moment, those blue eyes scar me like a flame, that is an order. I feel as if I were newly born. Last judgment, brothers, prophet, new birth. From a demon. They tap by him in his will. I believe that. I've got a cartoon buck in the back of my uh, office there about the Pope, Pope John Paul, presenting him as a sort of a Superman or Marvel, and that uh, comic book has a newspaper reporter, that'd be the one, a newspaper reporter leaving the arena after hearing Pope John Paul speak, and he says, I feel like something's happened to me. I can't describe it, but a change is born. That's right, the devil's got you, bud. Amen. They're taking their trap for him and his will. You take Earl Nelson, 1926, on June the 10th, the ravished body of Mrs. Lillian St. Mar Mary was discovered beneath the bed of an unoccupied room in her boarding house. Next, Mrs. Georgia Russell was killed June 26. August 16th, a blinding light took control of Earl Nelson, caused him to fall upon Mrs. Mary Nesbitt in Oakland with such appalling violence, even seasoned police officers blanched at sadistic measures using a sexual assault upon the woman. October 19th, killed another one. October 20th, killed another one. Put him in jail, what did he say? He said, the demons control me through pain. If I refuse to follow their instructions, they created terrible blinding headaches that lasted for days. The dreadful headaches would start then, the pain would continue until I agreed to follow their instructions. When I gave in to killing, the headaches stopped instantly. I learned to listen for their voices. I've always been a student of the Bible, Nelson declared, and Christianity teaches that Satan and his demons are real. I'd ask him for mercy, but I believe Satan used me as a means to destroy innocent people. Amen. The fellow told the truth. He believed that the devil gets certain people gets control of them. He said, I'm not a miller like Earl Nelson. I'm not no Adolf Hitler. No, I know what most of you are. You're just common, ordinary people. Just common ordinary people with common ordinary sins. That's how the devil gets a hold of you. Amen. You know how the devil gets a hold of us? He gets a hold of us through our sins. He goes up to the Lord and says, what about that? What about that? What about that? The Lord says, okay, get him. And the trap by the devil's will. Something else I learned. Come down here and look at verse uh, 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Peter was kept in prison. I learned that we, I say we, mankind, are in prison, we're in jails, we're, we're jailbirds. You say, how? Here's the prison, see it? That's the prison. Let's see you get out. You ain't going to make no jailbreak. You don't make a jailbreak till you're dead. The day you die, you're shut up in that earthen vessel at your prison house. You better take care of what you, how you take care of that house. You're going to be in it for a while. You're inside a prison. No escapes. That's what Buddha said. Buddha said, I'm in this prison here. I got to get out of it. I got out of it. That's what Buddhism is. That's what meditation is. It's an attempt to release and get out of this thing that's causing you this problem. That's why some of you kids mess with drugs before you're saved. You know what the trouble was? You couldn't stand to live in the jail. You're going to make a jailbreak. And you got out, you know what you found? You're right back in it again. You're in a prison house. Unsaved people are in prisons. People in prison go stir crazy. They go, they go, they lose their minds in jail. I had a fellow one time that he was in jail 15 years and finally went plumb out of his mind. He spent all day in jail. This was in a Russian prison back in the early 1900s, taking a deck of 52 cards and trying to turn them over in the order he said he's going to turn them over in. He wrote down the order. He'd turn over the 52 cards in, and then he dealt the cards. When he didn't, whenever 
met, missed a card, he reshuffled the deck. After 15 years, he turned over all 52 cards in the order he'd had them written down. That's, you know, shuffling, dealing, you know, about once every two minutes, 12 hours a day for 15 years. Crazy, he lost his mind. I had a case one time, fell out a heart attack in the solitary in one of those old prisons, and they couldn't figure out what it was, and finally a jailmate said, well, didn't you hear about that game he played called the button? And the guard said, no. He said, well, I thought you put him in solitary, he'd take a button off his suit and throw it, and then go hunt it in the dark. And that's how he kept his mind, hunting that button in the dark. He said he'd killed a man, murdered a man in cold blood, and in order to keep him going crazy, thinking about the fellow he'd killed in the dark, he'd see the fellow's face. Every time he put him in solitary, he'd throw that button. So you notice that every time he came out of there, had one button missing off his shirt, had to get so back on. And the guard said, yes, but I don't see how that did it, how that uh, fight lost his mind. This time had a heart attack in there, died inside that place, wasn't very old. And the prisoner said, you find, him, you find the button? He said, yeah, we found it. It was uh, caught in a cobweb over in the corner. That thought of taking that button and throwing that button in the dark and heard that thing hit and run across that floor and try to pick it up, and one time he'd thrown that thing and it caught in the cobweb and landed. Heart attack. Crazy. Thought the guy he'd killed probably caught the button. Folks, so that never happened to me. Why, there are all kinds of people in the insane asylum right now. All kinds of people outside the insane asylum ought to be in the insane asylum. <laughs> you, know what the, you know what the problem is? The problem is uh, you're in a prison. You're in a prison house, and sometimes the things in that prison house will drive you batty. Here's a fellow who spent a lot of time in prison, Charles Manson. He said he liked to play guitar. He trained his voice and started to write songs. A whole new world was created me, created while I was behind bars playing the guitar. He said uh, his girls that worked for him were arrested, members of the Charles Manson family, charged with killings, most of them judged to be guilty. Uh, they called him Sweet Daddy and called him God and called him Satan. His unwed mother was a teenage hustler. Several of the girls who worked for him and killed for him graduated from college. One woman had a master's degree. Why? Because Manson believed in education. I guess you believe in that, don't you? He said, when he got out of jail in March 1967, I have been in jail almost all my life. The bars, the windows, block out the sun. When I was a kid, they had windows with two bars, and then later the windows had four bars. Then 16, they have taken away all of the sunshine. Some of you find yourself this morning in a prison, you're trapped. There isn't a ray of light getting into either. I know now those 40, 45, 50, 55 years old, 60 getting up there, and their whole life is just a hell inside. Some of them are saved. Some of them are saved. The trouble is, you're caught. And you're caught with yourself. And yourself is a jail. It ain't a good place to live. You know, you know a bad place to live? Inside this body. It, it's always giving you trouble, isn't it? Amen. Can you name one trouble you got that didn't come from being in there? I can't. You just get rid of it, you'd have it made, but you can't get rid of it without kicking the bucket. You're in a prison. Now to remind me to say this, you're appointed to die. Look at verse 4. You're appointed to die. Our appointment is death. The Bible says it is appointed a man wants to die. But after this, the judgment. Death is completely democratic, brethren. Death shows no respect of persons. Verse 4, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers. That's four times four. That's six times four quarters. Sixteen, To keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people, to bring him forth to be killed, appointed to, to death, appointed to die. And listen, if you're an unsaved person in this building this morning, you may skip every appointment and Get around every appointment and beat out every appointment you have in life and be late for an appointment, but there's one appointment you won't miss. And that's for the record in the guy's car that got killed. The reaper rides, boy. He rides by you, he'll reap you. You're appointed to death just as sure as a kamikaze diver is appointed to death. Back in World War II, they have what they call kamikaze divers. Most fellows put a white scarf around their neck to show they were appointed to die. And their job was to ram into the American cruisers and destroyers out there off the shore of Okinawa and Iwo Jima and put those things at the bottom of the ocean. They damaged 288 ships and sank 34 ships. One of those fellows died. His name was Aichi Okabe. He was born in 1923. He killed himself February 1945 and plowed into a destroyer called the Calhoun. 
That fellow died. He left behind him a letter, and they read the letter after he was dead. Let me tell you what he did first. He went the destroyer. He unleashed two bombs with the main deck. They killed the gun crews at both mounts. One bomb exploded in the aft room, killing everybody in it. One bomb ruptured the main steam line in the forward engine room, pierced both boilers, and blew a four of a 20-foot hole in the ship below the water line, breaking the keel. Down went the ship in about 15 minutes. H.O. Cobby, they found his letter in home, and it said, We live and die in Jesus. <laughs> he was a Christian. We live and die in Jesus. Let us fall like cherry blossoms in the spring. <laughs> you say, what a terrible way to die. There's all kinds of ways to die. You're appointed to die. That's just good a way to die of suffering the hospital of cancer 15 years. That's just good a way to die of some of you guys go out there on these motorcycles and get and wind up at a vegetable in a hospital for four or five years. There's all kinds of ways to die. But you're appointed to die. He's kept in prison till he's dead. You know where you are? You're kept in prison till you die. And if you're unsaved, your appointment is with death and with hell, friend. I don't, I don't, Blanche, talk you about hell. I tell people all this country they're going to hell. I going to hell before I got saved. You're going to hell before you get saved. And before you got saved, you were going to hell. And if you're saved, you're going to go to hell anymore. And hell's a real place, and I don't hesitate to talk about it at all. You're unsaved, that's where you're going, you're going to hell. And hell didn't get air conditioned just because your house did. And hell didn't get redecorated just because your apartment did. That hell, that Bible is a real hell. A fellow's preaching up in Cincinnati one time and talking about hell this and hell that, and some liberal that congregation said, "Our hell is right here in this place, right here in this town." And he said, "There's three differences you got to take into consideration, there, friend." He said, "In the first place, the Christians here in this town there aren't in hell. In the second place, you got a chance to get saved in Cincinnati. You ain't gonna have any in hell." And he said, "The third place, the Ohio River's out there, yeah. <laughs> and there's no water in hell." You got that thing wrong. All right, come on down to verse 6. I learned something else about mankind. When Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between... I never seen the word Peter. I don't think of, of reading Peter. Peter. I got a telephone call this morning from a New Zealander. I wish Pete could have been home to talk to him. He was phone down there at 2 o'clock in the morning with his time, 2 in the morning. And he said, is that you, Peter? <laughs> I almost said, yes, that's me, old boy. <laughs> he was talking He was talking about how he enjoyed the tapes and books and everything. He wanted to have Mike Gilbert get down there real quick so he hear him preach. Well, the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keeper before the door kept the prison. Oh, and I say this, the unsaved man, mankind in general, is asleep and bound. What a condition to be in. Can you imagine how insulting that must be for some of you sitting here this morning if you're unsaved? You know what I'm telling you? I'm telling you you're in jail. I mean, glad in the county pajamas is going to play a rock hockey. <laughs> and there you are in jail, and you're sound asleep, and you're bound hand and foot. Isn't that a way for a man to talk to fellows raising a family and making a living? That's why you don't hear this kind of talk down in the First Baptist Church and the Methodist Church. Fellows down there making a living and piling up money and raising kids and grandkids. They think, me asleep, me bound. Well, who do you think you're talking to? I know I'm talking to. I'm talking to a jailbird. <laughs> Man, you're bound and you're asleep. Haven't you ever wondered why some Roman Catholic gets so upset and you witness to them? You know why it is? They're asleep. Do you ever meet a fellow who's sound asleep and just enjoying his rest real good? And you come alongside and say, hey, man, wake up. <laughs> you think he gets up and says, yeah, I sure do appreciate you helping me out. <laughs> No, they get upset. They're asleep. Bill Rice, John R. Rice's brother, or son, or cousin, or nephew, I don't know which, but Bill Rice was over there in Rome one time with a friend, and they were in St. Peter's, and they were standing in a big line that were going to kiss the foot of this statue. And Bill Rice and his friend were going to kiss it, but they wanted to measure on the foot of that statue how much of that foot had been kissed away. They read about it, you know. It was, a, it was Simon Peter, I think, of Statue of Peter, and with black. The black, you know, some kind of black material turned black with age or something. And they were sitting in that line for about 30 minutes, and everybody came up there, bent down, kissed this foot. And when Bill and his friend came up there, both of them took their thumb and forefinger and just measured how much, about that much that foot had been kissed away with people's lips. Things made out of metal, I mean, copper or brass, that much. And they left and got back out of line, looked back, you know what happened? The next 40 people came through there, all went up and did this. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. 
You know, you know what they're doing? They're bound. They're bound. I mean, tradition just got them. Follow the leader. They're asleep and bound. Why? Several years back, we had a man named Jim Jones down in Guyana. Had a terrible debacle down there, and hundreds of people committed suicide. And of a race that very rarely committed suicide. And when all those people kicked off, the newspaper reporter said, the terrible, the unbelievable was happening, and the only question is why it's too terrible to discuss. I thought to myself, well, you silly fools, the reason why it happened is because that done not read the junk you wrote in the newspaper. Why, Jim Jones believes everything that you read in your morning newspaper. Your morning newspaper is for integration, he was for integration. Your morning newspaper is for liquor, he was for liquor. Your morning paper is for gay liberation and women lib, so was he. There wasn't one thing the news media is pushing that Jim Jones didn't believe in. On top of that, he was a queer. Committed adultery, mishandled money. He acted just like any editor would, have, would handle a thing. <laughs> you take that fellow and say, how could it happen? Why, he's asleep and bound by sin. The newspaper reporters are asleep and bound by sin. The editors are bound by sin. They have an old, they have an old uh, parable about a, a thief that went to hell and then a priest that went to hell. And the parable says the, the thief was putting a cauldron and they got the pot boiling under it and scalded him for about five years and then let him out. And they put the priest in some nice lukewarm water, but after about five years, they began to build up the fire, and after in there 15 years, the fire got hotter. And then the fire, of course, isn't true, but the parable said, you know, well, why did he get it hotter? And he said, well, because he was had more responsibility and damn more people than the thief did. Now, that isn't true, but it is true that uh, they were sure to see the greater damnation. I said, Jim, going to get to hell, he won't have a place as hot as the fellow who run the Gannett string of newspapers will. The Gannon string of newspapers was put out by a bunch of men that taught Jim Jones everything he ever believed. Jim Jones didn't believe the Bible, he believed the Associated Press. Like some of you, believe in Time, Newsweek, Life, Look, U.S. News World Report, all that sloppy, godless, depraved garbage. CBS, NBC, Mutual. And now we take you to Mike Wallace for 60 minutes. You better watch your steps, stupid. Those people are bound by a sin and they're asleep in a grave in a prison house. They don't know what they're talking about. All right, that isn't all. Come on down here, verse 7. I learned mankind needs light and deliverance. The angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison. That's what you need, light, light. Mrs. Heather Buckley, 1956, wrote this. My husband Dan and I had many experiences with the Ouija board. Dan is in a deep trance medium, and I am the moderator. I talked through with him. Our first communication came in the Ouija board. We immediately contacted entities who could help us learn about the life beyond and about how to live more happily here. Our first instructions were, challenge every entity who comes to you by saying, do you stand in the light, or Christ's light, or the light of God, or some other meaningful term. If you contact wandering entities who are up to no good, they will go away. We tried this and found it worked. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. A false light. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Listen, the light of this world is Jesus Christ. And the only light this world ever got that was true light was Jesus Christ, not up a Ouija board. Listen, you want to blow a Ouija board? I can tell you how to blow a Ouija board. Don't you ask that Ouija board, does this spirit come from the light? You ask that Ouija board, Ouija, tell me, what do you think about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? You watch that table skip and bounce all over the room, man. <laughs> man needs light. Man needs deliverance. You'll get the light from the Word of God. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Thy word is a lamp to my path, a light to my feet. How much light have you got on it? I just don't have much light in my problems. There's the light right there. I had a meeting down in Fort Walton one time and I asked a late year old girl to pray for me before I got up to preach. I never will forget that prayer. It went like this. I wrote it down. Real good. I never heard anything any better. She said, Bless Brother Ruckman and help him to preach the word whether we like it or not. <laughs> That's real good. That shed light, and sometimes Christians don't like too much light on a thing. Listen, brethren, a well used bathtub and an unused Bible produces a Pharisee. Do you know what I said? I said, a well-used bathtub and an unused Bible produce a Pharisee. I'll tell you something else. A well-used library and an unread Bible produces concentration camps. And you better believe it. 
The trouble is, unsaved men need light. The blind. The Bible said the blind are the God of this world. Over in Belfast Island, in a building about this size, back in World War II, was a large congregation. About 500 people. Preacher was preaching. All lights were off. The lights were off because it was a blackout in 43 because of bombings. They didn't want bombs dropped on them. All the lights were off. And there was a blind man in the congregation that night. And suddenly the lights came on. And when the lights came on, the preacher stopped automatically. And the congregation stirred. And the blind man stood up and said, What's the matter? What's wrong? He didn't know what gone wrong. What's the matter? What's wrong? Why did he stop? And the fellow next to him put his hand and says, Okay, the lights came on. But you see, he couldn't see the light coming on because he was blind. You know, so might be somebody sitting in this congregation this morning. What I'm saying to you it has no penetrating power at all. You know why it is? You're just as blind as a bat. Now, our brother down here in the front row, he's got better eyes inside him and you got an outside of you. You need light. Light to keep you making a shipwreck of things. Back in the old days, that would and what they call the Cornwallis shipwreckers. And the Cornwallis shipwreckers were fellows that hung out on the shore of western England, that bad coast there where the cliffs are and rocks. You know what they do? They would tie lanterns to donkeys and run those donkeys up and down those cliffs, those lanterns, so when a ship came in there, I thought it was a lighthouse, and come in and hit against the cliffs. And they'd go down and take those drowned people and, and rob them, and the people who were alive, they'd beat them up and rape them and steal what they had. The uh, trouble was they had the wrong light. Wrong light. You find a light, but the light of the world and the light of this book, you wind up in a shipwreck. Back when the Bermuda colonies were first started, they sent a letter back to the king of England. They said, please tear down all the lighthouses. You're ruining the colony. <laughs> you know what they meant? They meant half the income of that colony they got from ships getting wrecked on the islands down there, around the Bahamas. Every time you put up a lighthouse, the ship wouldn't wreck, and you couldn't get the income off it. The light of the world is Jesus I like a little girl one time, asked her what they're doing in her church. She said, we're having a revival. She meant revival, you know, she couldn't say it. She said, we're having a revival. Well, revivals always come where there's a re-emphasis on the Bible. I go out in the, in the, in the meetings on the highways and edges, I have what they call Bible conferences. For the Bible conference I have, the pastor usually calls them revivals. I don't know if he's right and call them that, but that's what he calls them. You get back to the book, you get a reviving. All right, now that isn't all. Look at verse 7. I learned something else. I learned that a man can have instantaneous salvation. He smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Rise up. What? What? Again. Again. There's no gradual business to it. Uh, you take the reason why. The reason why Christians have such a time with this, it takes so long to build character after you're saved. You get kind of worn out, don't you? I mean, you say just like that. You think the whole thing going to be just like that. It ain't going to be like that. Bob Jones, the senior, said, hey, fool can get saved in a second, but it takes a lifetime to build a Christian character. But the problem is, what about after that? Some of you are at a terrible disadvantage, aren't you? I mean, before you got saved, you never took time to build any character. Now you're saved, you haven't got any character to run on. <laughs> You, you just have to trust the grace of God, like right? they you do, get you through. Like a, you know, it's a, these people try to get saved by works. They don't have a time of it. Do you realize how good you'd have to be to be saved? Well, what a, what a character, what character you'd have to have to be saved without Christ? Man, I, I wouldn't even attempt it. Remind me of a colored preacher went around to one of his prisoners' houses and sat down and said, Have you been walking this straight and narrow path lately? He said, Yes, Pastor, I'll show hands. Said, you've been paying the preacher? Said, I'll pay the preacher as regular do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Said, you have family devotion? Yes, I sure do. Said, you was uh, giving up stealing chicken, ain't you? Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir, boss. I ain't stole no chicken. Said, how about stealing pigs? You ain't stole nobody's hog lady, has you? Said, no, sir. No, sir. So happened. He walked out the door. The cop thought turned to his wife, and he said, I sure I'm glad he didn't mention ducks. I've been going to hell for sure. <laughs> That's the kind of mess you get into. You try to get saved for your works. No man has good enough character to get saved. You'll be right in one place. You'll be wrong someplace else. But as far as getting saved goes, just like that. Martin Luther got saved off one verse in the Bible. He read the just shall live by faith. Augustine got saved off of one verse in the Bible. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ to make not provision of the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Henry Vickers got saved on one verse. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
John that Edwards got saved in one verse, now unto him be glory forever and ever. You take Talmadge himself got saved in one verse. You never get the, never guess the verse he got saved on. He read, even the dogs eat at the crumbs that fall from the master's table. <laughs> That's the one he got saved on. It too, took two verses to get a hold of me. You never guess what they were in a million years. I read one verse in Exodus where the Lord said to, to Moses, I am that I am. Man, that hit me hard. I've been studying Buddhism. And I've been trying to find definitions to describe transcendentalism all my life. I couldn't find any. Buddha said, he who says does not know, he who knows does not say. But this one in the Bible said, I am that I am. And I said, now there, that, that, that's something there. That's something there. I mean, if a fellow could actually describe God, all he could say was, there's an eternal presence. That got me. I saw one in John that got me. He said in John chapter 1, the new birth was not by the will of man. A man couldn't will it, nor by the will of flesh. You couldn't think yourself into it. You couldn't meditate yourself into it. You couldn't transcendental yourself into it. It had to be of God. I got a hold of that. Got saved. You know how I was saved? Like that. You ever saved? You saved just like that. It may take you some time to grow in grace, but you ever saved? You saved just like that. All right, come on down here in verse 8. I learned something else. I learned when I do get saved, I should follow the Lord Jesus Christ and put on the proper kind of clothes. That'll preach. Hey, and so he did, and he saith to him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. Those garments are described in Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God. Take your stand, follow the Lord. Any, at any cost, anyway. Old painters, uh, in the old days, back in 1800, 1900, just were very careful about paint pigment and things. And one painter was asked, uh, Why don't you go to that gallery and look at those pictures? And the painter said, uh, those pictures are very poor pictures. And he said, you ought to look at them. He said, no, they might hurt my style. He said, I make a habit never looking at any pictures that don't improve my style. Boy, some Christian could get a hold of that. If you just spend more and more time, see, with the Christians that have done more than you're doing and accomplished more than you're accomplished and are close to the Lord than you are and have been through more than you've been through, and spend your time comparing yourself with them, then spend your time with a bunch of rats and mouse underneath you, your Christian life would be different. Amen. Your character would be different. Amen. Amen. A good musician can't afford to listen to rotten music. It'll ruin his ear. A good painter can't look at, look, afford to look at rotten pictures. It'll destroy a sense of color and line. A good preacher can't waste his time listening to some, listening to rotten sermons by some rotten preachers. And a good Christian can't spend his time following a bunch of rotten whirling when he ought to be following Christ. I got a friend. I, I, had a, I had a friend. I had a comrade. I had a friend named Glenn Shunk who was dead and gone now, and he's largely responsible for me being in the ministry. And Glenn Shunk was a Christian in World War II, converted Catholic. And he gave me one of the most beautiful samples I ever heard of following the Lord I ever heard in my life. He and a fellow were out in reconnaissance and came back in a snowstorm and couldn't find the way back to their lines, and they came along a path in the snow. There were two paths crossed like that. One went this way and one went that, that way. And for love and money, they couldn't remember which one of those things it was. And Glenn Shunk, being a Christian, bowed his head right there in the snow and prayed. And said, Lord Jesus, we want to get back safe for a line. Would you please show us which one to take? Lord, just take the left one. <laughs> just like that. No fleece, just take the left one. He took the left one. And they got back the lines. And the next morning it quit snowing and an attack developed and they went out across the same line of departure and, and it went right across that place where they came to turn. And going down the right road to that place where they would have turned, they found a German machine gun nest down there, that thing at about 100 yards with a muzzle right down that track. Right down that track. Now what he did there was he, he said, follow me. And old Glenn Shute followed it. All right, now finally, look at verse 11. I learned this. I learned when a Christian is saved and born again, he needs to come to himself and see what God has done. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety the Lord has sent his angel, delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of Jews. You need to come to yourself and see what God has done. If you're saved, God has done something for you in your life. In the case of Peter, it's almost like being resurrected from the dead. The fellow was appointed, and he was lying there, condemned, tied, and he got out. It's almost like Christ coming up in the grave. I guess that's why I connected with Easter. Paul says to a king, he said, Why should it be thought an anything incredible with you that God should raise somebody from the dead? 
Why should it be thought with you an incredible thing that God should raise the dead, he says. Happens all the time. Some of you ladies have flowers on this morning. Where would you get your beautiful flower from? Dirt. See dirt out there? You've got evidence of the resurrection every hand. The flower you have came out of the ground of dirt. You know where an albatross comes from? It comes according to Talmadge. It comes from a senseless shell. Just an old shell out there. Out comes an albatross. A butterfly comes from a caterpillar. They found a seed in Egyptian tombs and buried for 3,000 years. A man brought one of them uh, to England on the 4th of June, 1844, and planted them, and 30 days they sprang up. Does the election. You need to come to yourself and see what God has done for you. My brethren, do you realize, stand here singing this morning, he arose, you realize what we're singing about? Have you got that thing down? You realize that graveyard out there cannot hold you? And the ones you buried, it's not going to hold. They're coming out. They're coming out. I don't care how many tears, how big the undertaker's bill is, and all the folks around the place, and the winding sheet, and crying over you, and disputing the will, and all this and that, you're not going to stay down. You're not going to go. The devil can't get rid of you. You're coming up. You've got to get a hold of that thing. The Bible said when he was come to himself, now I know. I've got the thing for certain. I know of a surety. God's people need to do that. I don't know how about you are about these things. I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. The fellow said, how do you know you're saved, you know? I told the fellow one time, I said, you just keep your head open about a minute and I'll show you something. And I said, I'm going to tell you about two days' work. Now, here's the first day of work. The first day's work, I came in at 2 o'clock in the morning, dead drunk, went to bed. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, I got up by myself and went through the room and got the only suit of clothes I had and put them on and went to open the transmitter at 6.30 in the morning, got me some black coffee, and came open the transmitter in the morning and gave beer advertisements all day and played rock and jazz music and cussed and told dirty jokes. Got a bunch of people knew and got some beer and got a headache from drinking the beer, came back to work the desk the rest of the day, and then went home, heard some more dirty music over the radio. They lay down that night, and the next night got up and got my drums, went out to the dance band to play till 2 o'clock in the morning. For that day's work, I got about five bucks. That's one day's work. That's 1949. I'll tell you about another day. Another day, I got off an airplane about uh, 12 o'clock at noon, checked in the Marriott Hotel. And went up there, and along about noontime, I came down and got me a smorgasbord for a meal. So I went back up and I read the Bible for about an hour and took notes off, and I lay down and got me some good rest, and then got up and prayed the Lord about an hour, went off to a meeting, got up and talked, and 14 people got saved. I said, I came back at night, lay down in the bed, got me on some good Christian music before I went to bed, and learned me some German before I went to bed. Went to bed about 12 o'clock, knowing if I died, I'd wake up and go to Jesus Christ. I said, if you can't see the difference between those two days, and I got 50 bucks for that day's work. <laughs> I said, if you can't see the difference between those two days, you couldn't see through a plate glass window where the window pane knocked out. Amen, brother. Amen. I mean, don't you tell me I haven't got out of Herod's jail. I got out. I got out. Being the Lord showed up in there, brother, and the light shone about the prison, and I got the chains kicked off. Now, what you need to do is see what God has done for you. Do you realize sitting here this morning it's possible to conquer outer space without missiles? <laughs> you can get them here further than they've ever flown with Jesus Christ. You want to get a hold of that? You know it's possibly a happy Christian even in the mess you're in this morning? <laughs> oh, so we're about being happy and being the happy. One time a king called in four wise men and he said, Tell me how I can be a happy king and make all my people happy. They went out and messed around for a couple of years and came back with a bunch of rules that long. And he got tired of reading. He finally turned to the fourth fellow and said, uh, what do you got? He said, two words. And the king said, what are those? And the wise man said, love God. He said, oh, you got to me after being out there for three or four years with two words? He said, yes. He said, well, how will that work? And the wise man said, well, if you love God, you'll be happy. And if you love God, you'll keep your people happy. They'll be happy with you. That's it. That's it. The problem is how to love God and keep on loving God and what you're going to go through. You know it's possible to love God and be happy in God even when you're in a mess? Some, some night here we're going to have a, we're going to have a, a foul ball night <laughs> or, or trouble night. Some night here at this church I'm going to have all these people stand up that have really been through something. I'm not just a little old finicky, you know, she said, me said, me said, me and me and me, all that kind of stuff. I mean, people have been through something, stand up and just tell what God did for them when they're going through that mess. Now I'll show you something. 
It is possible. I have called to God and heard no answer for why. I have seen the thick curtain drop and sunlight die. My voice has echoed back, a foolish voice. The prayer restored intact to its silly source. I have walked in darkness, choked with thirst. In all my minds of night, he was there first. Whatever dead tunnel thou art lost, he finds thee. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? From this perfect darkness a voice says, I have not. I have not. It just seems like it. We get in messes and we always think we got in there before the Lord did. And you wonder where he's at. He got in there before you ever got in there. He's already been through it. That's the business. It's possibly happy in Christ. Years ago, there was a bad train wreck on a, a thing called the Pennsylvania R&R. &R. I used to know the name of those. B&O, the Santa Fe, you know, and the Illinois, Rock Island, the Central, 90TWA, and American, you know, and, and Dell and all that. But they had a bad wreck, and the engineer in that wreck who survived, the fireman was killed, the Blakeman was killed, one engineer was killed, about 20 of the passengers. The engineer to survive was just a gibbering idiot, just all cracked up. And the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, a fellow named Adder Burley, came to him where he was in the hospital and put his arm around him and said, Old man, we had a pretty tough run of luck, haven't we? And hugged him. And that hug brought that fellow to his senses. And he said, What do you mean we? He said, I was out on the road. And the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad picked up a telephone there on the room and phoned his secretary and said, When the press comes, tell them I take the full responsibility for the accident. Got that old boy's sanity back. I saw you get in a mess like you seem like you're just never going to possibly get through. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You got a prison <laughs> that owns the railroad. And he said, I will take the full responsibility of the mess you're in. You said, I got it for myself. Well, if you got it yourself through sin, he paid for your sins. He got you in, he can get you out. It's possibly happy in a mess. You know that? You know what you know what Christians do? They kick the cat. You was kicking the cat in this, I'll show you the mean. Here's the president of a large sales corporation. And he's late getting to work. And he has some coffee and takes ten minutes he shouldn't have taken. He starts to work and speeds to get there and gets arrested. And he gets pulled over and given a ticket. And when he leaves, he goes down the road with the ticket. And it says, that blankety blank, he got no right. I only going 10 miles over. A lot of people are going 15 miles over. Besides that, I don't know, you know, you know. And he gets to his office. And woe be to the first man that meets him. And the first man meets him is the head of salesman. And he says, the head of salesman, you got that contract for so-and-so out of account I told you to close? No, so I've been working. Well, get the thing or lose your job. <laughs> and goes to the door. And that salesman goes out to the door and says, well, how do you like that? Isn't that gratitude? I've got that account for that account. And just because I've been working on that one for five months, what's the big push for the thing? I don't see why. And woe be to the person who meets him. And about that time, he meets his secretary. You got those six letters I told you you completed by five o'clock today? No, you're going to get them? Well, I don't believe I can. Well, if you want to keep your job, you better get them done. <laughs> you know. And she goes out the door. Well, that's the fine way to talk to me. After the work I and all I know about him, he's got a fine one to go, you know. And I, I, I can't get those things done. I have to get somebody to do them for them. And about the time she meets the telephone switchboard operator, throws the desk at her. Do two of these for them and have men before 3 o'clock this afternoon. i got to do the other three. And goes on out. And the switchboard operator says, Ooh, she thinks she is putting the work off of me. I do more work around here than anybody. They think I'd just sit around here and talk all day. But I do more work than them. I don't see why. And she and woe be to the person that meets her. <laughs> And she goes home and she comes to her house and she's divorced and got a single kid there about 12 years old lying in front of the television watching the television. He got a slit in the brick of his back. <laughs> got a slit in the seat of his back. Brick of his pants. <laughs> he got a rip. <laughs> and he got a rip in the seat of his britches and she comes in she takes one look. You good for nothing kid. I told you to change your clothes. You came home from school. Those aren't the right clothes you know that you wore to school. I told you to change your clothes. Get upstairs out your dinner. No TV for three days. And woe be the person that kid meets. <laughs> and that kid starts upstairs. Oh, there's a little accident. Could have happened to anybody. Never gave him time. Stole that split him alive of the school. I don't see why. About that time, the cat walks by. <laughs> now, you know a lot of Christians do. They kick the cat. <laughs> Now, the way to handle that thing, the way to handle that thing is when the thing first gets you, get the victory then, brother. Get the victory over then. Come to yourself. <laughs> and Peter was come to himself and consider these things.
That's the business. Years ago in this country, they had a great train wreck, and the fellow that, whose name was sung, and he wrote song and ballad after that was Casey Jones. Come all you around this if you want to hear the story about a brave young engineer, you know. Casey Jones, what was the brakeman name, all that kind of business, you know. And he said to the fireman, boy, you better jump to the bottom end. There's going to be a bump, all that stuff. Why, Casey Jones was the sorriest critter that ever lived. <laughs> Those had these fake heroes they make, you know. Yeah. Let me tell you about Casey Jones. Six feet four. Born 1863. Ran the southern Missouri and Illinois Central. He had a whistle. He had a train whistle he made himself. Sound like a whippoorwill. And he'd come down the track. He'd blow that whippoorwill, and everybody on the track would set their clocks by Casey's whistle. That's how good he was about time. At 1900 A.D., at uh, 36 years old, he piloted four passenger trains daily in a 188-mile stretch. He was pilot number 382, April 29, 1900, out of Memphis, and a fellow gave him extra money to make up 85 minutes of bad time. 95 minutes. He headed out of Memphis, heading down toward Mississippi, and coming down there, he was 95 minutes behind time. He made up 60 minutes in 102 miles at 105 miles an hour. That's on a steam engine, boy. 105 miles an hour. He took a siding, lost five minutes as the northbound cannonball went by, took off at 75 miles an hour to Vaughn, Mississippi, and uh, with 14 miles to go, he was only two minutes behind. Could have made it. And then he hit a caboose with four cars left on a siding. There was a siding there with a bunch of cars that went by like this and left the caboose out in the main track, and before the siding could be, could be pulled clear of the siding, he hit the caboose in the back end of that thing, and he was the only one killed in the wreck. Nobody else killed in the wreck. No pastors, none of his firemen a break. Here's the report on Casey Jones from Illinois Central. Quote, Engineer Jones was solely responsible for the collision by reason of having disregarded the signals given him by Flagman Newberry. Flagman Newberry posted warning torpedoes 30 telegraph poles away on both side sidings. Knowing that caboose hadn't been clear, that signalman put away, put on 30 telephone poles on both sides of that thing, warning flare, saying, don't go on, and he just went right slap through them. Then after he's dead, come on all your rounders if you want to hear the story about a brave young engineer. Why, he was a fool. Don't you see the difference the two cases I gave you? I gave you one case where engineer did the right thing and liked to crack up for it, and God took care of him and took the responsibility for it. That's when you decide to do what's right. The other case I gave you was an engineer that made up his mind that he's just going to do what he'd do if he had to set a world record. He's going to do it. And he lost his life. He's a fool. I'm here to tell you here this morning, if you're not saved, that second engineer, is your, that's your man. And that second engineer, there's a flare here, and there's a flare there, and there's a flare from the Bible, and a flare from a gospel tract, and a flare from a street preacher, and a flare from a radio preacher, and a flare from a TV evangelist, and a flare from your mother, and a flare from your father, and a flare from me, and a flare from the Holy Spirit telling you, don't go on. And if you go on, you'll be your own death, friend. You'll be up there in a casket up there, and they'll have the lilies there. They have the rules of health and the lily for death. They'll have the lilies there, and you'll be there. And that preacher will be standing up there giving some funeral oration and lauding you like Casey Jones. He was a fine man. He took care of his wife and children and gave so generously the cerebral palsy fund and was active in civic affairs and social affairs. And he was an elder in the church all the days of his life. And it'd be a fake. Be a fake. You'd be in hell. You'd be in hell. You call me Lord and obey me not. You call me light and see me not. You say that I am the way and yet you walk not in it. You call me life but you don't desire me. You call me wise but listen not to me. You say that I am fair but you love me not. You say that I am rich but you ask for nothing. You say I am mighty yet you honor me not. You say I am just but you don't fear me. You say that I am gracious but you trust me not. You say that I am eternal and yet none of you seek for me. A man that's smart seeks for eternal life. He gets light. He gets deliverance. He gets resurrected. Father, bless the message this morning. May the Holy Spirit of God honor the Word of God and plant it deep in the hearts these people have heard today. I don't know how many unsaved people are here today. Probably not a great deal. Bound to be one or two. And I pray you might speak to them about these matters. May they see their condition, understand who's responsible for their life. 
And they're going to they're gonna have to take the responsibility. They're going to have to do right. Lord, bless the Christian here this morning, having a hard time of it, going through valleys and darkness and things they can't understand. Lord, help them to do right where they can understand things or not. Wait upon thee to come into the dungeon and strike off the chain and lift them up and take them on through the open door and open a door for them. Us remain in prayer, heads bowed and eyes closed in prayer for a few minutes.